This morning, we've been blessed by being able to see firsthand the love that God has for us as we welcome baby Ella into God's holy kingdom through the gift of baptism. Baptism has always been an important part of our ministry in the church. It was through the waters of baptism that God came and lived among us, marking himself with the sinners and not the saints. Baptism brought all of us to this church when we were no younger than Ella. And baptism, I've been glad to say, has marked my ministry. My parents often like to tell the story of my own baptism. For those of you who do not yet know my mother that well, she has a very strong will. So much so that she managed to convince a Methodist minister who doesn't believe in infant baptism to baptize me. And he was very joyous about the event. Either that or my sister paid him off. For the moment of my baptism, rather than a gentle sprinkling, he took a cup and was incredibly enthusiastic. <laughs> but I think it's safe to say that it worked. <laughs> One of my first worship services once I was ordained was a baptism. I'm also slightly sad to say that this little girl that I held and welcomed to God's family is now 11 years old and I feel old. <laughs> and so when thinking about what to share with you this morning as we celebrate baptism, I thought about having another worship service with the sermon as normal, and yet it didn't come. So instead of hearing a normal sermon, if there is such thing as a normal sermon, you get to hear a charge. And a charge is very similar to a sermon, except for the fact it's given at ordinations and induction services, and it's meant to have a response, other than saying, thank you, God, that the church service is over. A charge is meant to challenge you, to encourage you, and to empower you to do God's will in the world around you. The charge I was given at my own ordination was to re always remember my baptism, and I do. And while it was very tempting to take this minister's words and reshape them in my own format, this wasn't the message that God gave me this week. For while we're called to remember our baptism, we're also called to remember our baptism and allow that baptism to change the world around us. For we live in a day that is far from heaven on earth, and we as God's beloved children are called to change that. We're called to make a difference. We're called to share God's good news. And this is the message I have for you this morning. In our gospel reading today, we hear the words of Jesus Christ telling us what the two most important things to do in this world are. They're not to make sacrifices to God or put money in the offering. Instead, it's to love God and love the world around us. And so this is the charge that I lay before all of us today, that we are called to love in a world that's not always loving. We are called to follow Jesus' advice from a man that we don't expect to hear it from. For this morning's gospel reading starts with a scribe coming before Jesus. Ones who we are used to hearing are the adversaries of the good news as they seek to discredit the Lord of life. And yet one of them comes humbly before Christ, not with their own self-knowledge and knowing better than everyone else, but comes just as we come before the Lord, seeking to know God better, seeking to deepen his relationship with God and the world that he created and proclaimed good. And so we learn, as the scribe learned, what does it mean to truly honor God? What is the greatest commandment that we should center our life upon? And this is the good news this morning. For Jesus says we need only do two things. The first is love God. And at first glance, we're tempted to say, great, that's an easy thing to check off. We come to church, we read our Bible, we know that God loves us, and we respond with our own love. But Christ isn't finished. He says, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. 
And we need to ask ourselves, what does this mean? What is Jesus asking for us to do today? And this is a challenge God lays upon us to take upon ourselves. Daring to love God with all that we are and all that we'll one day become. Loving God with all our heart is frightening because it means that we allow God into the deepest part of our very being. We allow the Lord of light to see the bright parts in our life and the not so bright. We allow God's love to wash away the shadows as he forgives our sins and teaches us how to forgive others who have hurt us. Loving God with all of our heart means that we put God at the very center of our life itself, that we see everything else through the lens of God's love, that we seek to do everything to God's glory and God's praise. Love the Lord with all your mind. This one we as Presbyterians tend to be very good at. We're often told that we worship from the neck up. And loving God with all our mind means that we take the time to study his words, to allow his scripture to become part of our life, and to let his words inspire us to acts of kindness and love and grace and mercy we never thought possible. For all of us are called to be the priesthood of Christ. All of us are called to represent the Lord within this congregation and within the world outside of us. Loving God with all of our strength means that we allow God to use all that we are, all that will one day become. It means not giving up and saying, I can't make a difference. For a scripture bears witness that with God on our side, there is nothing in this world or the one that is yet to come that can stop us. Worshiping God and loving God with all of our strength means we are called to stand with our brothers and sisters in faith and do our job to help prepare the way for God's coming kingdom. And loving God with all our soul means that we will praise God today when things are going well and tomorrow when things aren't going as well. Loving God with all our soul means being able to bear witness that no matter where we are, be it in the valley or the shadow of death, we are able to proclaim that it is well with our soul, for we know that God is with us, and we know the Lord of life has forever conquered death itself. This is what it means to love God with all of our soul. It means not giving in to fear, because we are not alone. This itself seems like a great ta task to undertake, for God is asking that we use all of ourselves to share his love, all of our being to show how much we love and appreciate all the gifts that God has done for us. But this morning's lessons don't end there. For the second part of this morning's charge is that we allow this love that we have for God to change the way we see the world. To stop seeing people as us and them, as those who believe as we believe or think as we believe, and intend instead see them as God sees them, as his beloved children. The same ones that God loves just as much as he loves us, for when Christ went to the cross, he didn't just go for you and I, but for all people, for those who would accept his good news and those who would deny it, for those who would spread his love and those who he would try to suppress it. God calls us to love the world as we love ourselves, because love is the only way we can change this world from what it is to what it is always meant to be. And this is how we're called to serve God. This is how we're called to glorify God with all that we are and all that will one day become by daring to love in a world that's not easy to love, by daring to have faith that God will transform and heal and restore and resurrect 
all the good that he has planned for all of his people. But until that day comes, we as a family of faith shall work together to serve and love as Christ calls us to serve and love. And God has this plan for all of us here today. Little Ella is taking her first steps on this journey, but she'll walk with her family of faith who dare to love in this dangerous time until together as one family, heaven and earth are as one. Thanks be to God. Amen.